What's going on, Sloan? Not much. <laughs> um, an unfortunate amount of nothing. Um, yeah, just been kind of hanging out. You're supposed to say I'm I'm creating my next masterpiece, you know? Yeah. Well, m- maybe I'm doing that. I just don't realize it yet. But yeah, I'm, I've just been kind of trying to record and, you know, making the most of my time. Can you tell me about this partnership? What are you doing with all this merch that's been piled up? Yeah, so the very first day of tour is when we found out about everything happening with COVID-19. And we just played the first show of pretty much like two month tour um, and then had to just cancel everything else. So I had some freaking huge tubs of merch that were like printed for the tour specifically with like the dates on the back and everything. Um, and I had no idea what I was going to do with them. So I just kind of talked to my managers and they um, told me about Sweet Relief, which is a nonprofit that's helping out like touring band members and, um, you know, crew. And it's not um, COVID-19 specific. They've existed for a while, but obviously like it's kind of ramped up lately for people that would have been on tour that are just kind of in a hard place right now. And so I would have just had the shirt sitting around otherwise. So I thought it'd be good to, you know, donate the money to a good cause. How can people get involved? How can people purchase your merch? Direct them where to go. Yeah. Um, so the shirts that are going to Sweet Relief are at dayglowband.com. Um, and it's just like a t-shirt um, and poster bundle of the spring 2020 tour that did not happen. Yeah. And you can just order them online at dayglowband.com. What came first, the the stockpile of merch or I want to help artists during this time? At, well, at first it felt really isolating that um, we had to postpone the tour because I hadn't really seen or heard anybody else doing anything. Like I had seen a couple bands be like announcing, but it, it just felt really strange. So I didn't know like how much everybody else is going to be affected um, until like a couple days after. I mean, it did not take long for everything to stop so quickly. Um, But pretty immediately I I came to realize like like I could easily use what I have here to help other people out. And so, you know, so might as well. Yeah, absolutely. Your whole vibe is positivity. You know, that's every interview that you've ever done is about you're so upbeat. You're so happy looking all the time. I mean, I, I definitely have my fair share of bad days, and I, I just tend to try to think of things in an optimistic way. Um, I want to believe that there's good to come and that everything isn't a bummer, you know, even though sometimes things are bummers, and I definitely accept that. Yeah, I just want to use the gifts that I have um, and the music that I make to give people hope rather than make them think there is none. I mean, there's definitely a time and place for the contrary, you know, I think there's always a time to crank up some Phoebe Bridgers and just like cry myself to sleep. Um, I'm, I'm definitely an advocate of sad music every once in a while, but you know, there's got to be the other side too. Now you did an interview with Pop Dust on the blog side about a month ago, six weeks ago. You talked about um, Can I Call You Tonight and where that came from and the viral success and all this kind of th- stuff. but. I'm on the nerdier side of things and I want to talk to you about the recording itself. Yeah. You know, how did you go from UT freshman to having this record that everyone seems to love? Tell me about this DIY recording process. Yeah. So pretty much starting around like the age of 10, I just got completely obsessed with garage band um, and just the concept of recording and writing music. Um, I felt like it's just what I was looking for, which is kind of profound for like a 10 year old to come to realize, but I just immediately became obsessed in like a therapeutic way of like making music. Um, so yeah, I guess just over the years I kept learning more about production via YouTube and just like trial and error, like listening to songs I liked and, um, kind of listening to them. 
um, analytically and like trying to figure out like how that sound was being made. And um, I would go and tweak the plugins that I had. Yeah, I guess everything kind of led up to Dayglow about when I was 17, 18. And the project started with the concept of wanting to make music that could be played by a five piece band live like the Tame Impala type thing. I was really inspired by Kevin Parker and the way that he like produces and writes, but like has a band that plays them. So I thought that was a really cool idea and just started recording songs that way. And yeah, I just self-produced and mixed it all. And I'm still planning on doing that because um, I love producing and yeah. Can I Call You Tonight obviously is your biggest song, but it also was kind of a pain in the ass to get right, correct? Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I, I definitely like, I was really confident in the future of the song. Um, and I'm very much a perfectionist where like, I'm not going to want to release something um, unless I don't notice anything wrong with it, you know, which is hard to get to that point. And I don't think I fully ever do. Like there's things that I hear and can I call you and I'm like, ugh. But yeah, I... I went through a lot of final mixes and getting that song right because I was just confident that if I got it to where I thought it was going to be in the mix, then it would just like click and people would like it. And so um, thankfully, I fair share have. How sick of, it, of the song are you at this point? You know, it's kind of crazy. Like, I honestly, people always say like songs have like lives of their own and stuff. And I totally like think of the song as like a neighbor or something. Like I, I'm not like sick of it at all. It, it just feels like something that has a life of its own now. So like when I'm playing it live, it kind of feels like I'm like covering it or something. Like it's just really fun. And I try to just keep it fresh. And it's definitely like, it feels like a song that I wrote a couple years ago. Um, cause I'm regardless if I was an artist or like releasing music on the internet from 17 to almost 21, like a lot changes in your life regardless. So it kind of just feels like something that I did in high school. Um, but it's been awesome how it still keeps growing and people still enjoy it. You're only 21 now or 20. I'm only 20. Yeah, You're only 20. So, so you 20. have to have someone else buy your white claw for you. The reason I mentioned your age is that you were kind of the first generation to grow up with smartphones, to grow up with tablets. How did that affect, you know, you talk about, you got in, you didn't say I picked up guitar, you say I started working with GarageBand. So where did the musical chops come in? Where, how did you learn how to play guitar, how to do chord progressions, that sort of thing? I think chord progressions probably just came from like listening to a bunch of music and different types of music. I definitely went through a lot of phases um, as far from like loving Skrillex to like loving Connor Oberst. Um, like I, I went through a lot of phases in which I thought the type of music I was going to make. So I've kind of drawn a lot of different inspirations and in, to my production, like melodically. Um, but I started playing guitar around the same time I was starting GarageBand, I was definitely more fascinated in the possibilities that production brings. Like you can make anything it's limitless in a guitar, you know, only a six strings. But as I've like kept going and writing music, I've really started to enjoy like being good at an instrument or feeling like more confident on an instrument. So yeah, just over the years I've been looking up like YouTube tutorials and learning how to practice, but um, I've never really had like a traditional teacher and I, I can't read music or anything. So it's more just like a feel. Your style, you draw a lot from 80s synth pop and you don't, you're not, a, I wouldn't call you a vaporwave band. That's like a whole nother internet thing. I don't want the internet people coming after me. Um, <laughs> but there's a, a vaporwave influence in terms of warping the sound and getting that kind oh, yeah. of fuzzy tape hiss kind of thing going on. So where did your love of that 80s aesthetic come from? Where did you did you always love that? I mean, because your parents are probably from the 80s. So tell yeah. me about that. 
Well, first off, I do love Vaporwave. Um, yeah. I've never had somebody like recognize that. So, um, yeah, I don't know. I mean, there's just kind of like this whole thing that's happened, it seems like, where like the 80s and 90s pop culture is just like going in a cycle. I guess that's what culture does. Um, but I think the way in which I love optimistic a lot of times optimism is tied in with the nostalgia and like thinking of days that were better. And I feel like that is the eighties and the seventies where like a lot of messed up stuff happened then, but like for some reason we just think it was like a good vibe. Yeah. I don't know. I think a lot of eighties music is just really fun. And so I want my music to be fun. Now it's been what, uh, I guess two years since you put together Fuzzy Brain, which I think is a, a minor miracle that you were able to make this cohesive album, you know, in an era of Spotify playlists and release a single as, as quickly as you can. So what's next? You have this time during the quarantine to think about things. You have your little keyboard set up over there to the side for people, you know, who are listening to this as a podcast. So what are you working on now? What's the next step musically? It's nice that you recognize the record because I, I love good like, albums. I feel like it's getting more and more rare to like listen to an album all the way through and like not be tempted to skip it. One out of habit, just like people don't listen to songs all the way through, but two out of like there's more of a demand for new music all the time. And so I feel like there's less of a attempt at making full records that like are cohesive. And so I just want to really like keep doing that. Um, with Fuzzy Brain, it was even less of a like attempt at making a cohesive record than I'm doing now because it was kind of a collection of songs that I had made and I realized it was an album. And now with this record, I have like a clean slate. And so I'm specifically making an album and trying to make it like feel like it definitely exists as an album as much as I can. Um, but also recognizing that it is a playlist culture and like you got to have like songs that like are the singles. Um, but yeah, I, I love good cohesive albums. I feel like when you make an album, if it's a good album, the cream rises to the top, the singles kind of pop out. You know, I know I'm yeah, oversimplifying yeah. things, yeah. but I've just been kind of experimenting with, with that and trying to make something that I'm super proud of and I'm, I'm definitely getting there. So, um, I'm excited to be able to share all this new stuff when I can. Obviously the future is strange right now. Nobody knows what's going on, but I'm, I'm stoked for whenever this is a public thing. Now, you grew up outside of Fort Worth in the suburbs, right? Yeah, yeah. So I grew up kind of on like a farm. Like we have goats and chickens and stuff. And I, my dad went to UT, so we like came down to Austin maybe like twice a year or something, just like to visit and have fun. Um, and so I just always thought of Austin as like this utopian like thing that like I wanted to be here. So yeah, starting in like, high school I like, went to ACL and stuff and I had some friends that were like at UT so I'd come to Austin more and more often um, and I've just always wanted to be here I think it's a really fun city and really good vibe I love the people here I don't know it, it always felt like something I was waiting to happen so it's cool to like be in the moment now that I've been like waiting for um, but I also definitely love going back home now, I always thought, like, oh, like, I want to get into the city and, like, not be on this farm. But, like, I love going home and having that space. When you were first putting Fuzzy Brain together and, and first releasing it, you were still in college and, and trying to be a probably or at least trying to be a good student, I hope. Yeah. At, what, at what point when you were, were you like, maybe I can do music full time. Maybe music's my thing. Maybe I don't need to get a college degree. It was a pretty crazy series of events. Um, I finished the album and got to my dorm. I like sculpted on the album art, the head that's kind of of myself, um, the night before I drove down to Austin. 
Um, and so I like took the picture and then came to Austin through all of the songs on the internet and then the first week of school and everything just grew pretty quickly. I just had my first semester of school. So like you're still, or of college and you're still kind of just like getting the feel of college. Like, you don't really feel like you're like a college student yet. And then second semester of college is when everything started taking off and, um, you know, the music started doing really well on the internet. And so about halfway through my second semester of freshman year, I was like, well, I'm probably not going to keep going to school because um, I really want to do this. And my parents gave me their approval. Yeah, I mean, I was in and out of college pretty quick because <laughs> I was also only just like doing like core classes. Like I was going to be an advertising major, but I never really got to like do fun classes or anything. I was just in like a huge history class with like hundreds of people. So I just kind of slid in and out of college. Before I let you go, I want to talk about your visual art. You talked about the the head that's on the cover of your album. So mm -hmm. tell me tell me about your your influences from from that side. I was actually going to be an advertising major in college and like minor in film. So I've always loved like music videos and in movies and I'm definitely a, a very visual artist as well. Um, and so, yeah, I just am really inspired by like, you know, 70s pop art. Um, but the sculpture of my head, um, I was talking to this sculptor via email and he was actually going to do it for me. Um, and I was like, going to ask him his price. And then I was like, well, I've spent no money on this album and I've done everything myself. So like, why would I not at least try this final step to like sculpt something? I'd never sculpted before, but yeah, I just went to Hobby Lobby, got like $30 worth of clay and um, just went to town. All right. Well, thank you so much for talking to me. I really appreciate it. And I wish you the, the best of luck on whatever music project comes out next. Well, thank you. Yeah, I appreciate it a lot. All right. I'll talk to you later. Yeah, I'll see you.